Chapter 9 of Way of the Lawless by Max Brand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. At the same time, the rifles of two of the men of the posse rang, but they must have seen the fall of their leader, for the shots went wild, and Andy Lanning took off his hat and waved to them. But he did not flee again. He sat in his saddle with the long rifle balanced across the pommel, while two thoughts went through his mind. One was to stay there and watch. The other was to slip the rifle back into the holster and, with drawn revolver, charge the five remaining members of the posse. These were now gathered hastily about Bill Dozier, but Andy knew their concern was in vain. He knew where that bullet had driven home, and Bill Dozier would never ride again. One by one, he picked up those five figures with his eyes, fighting temptation. He knew that he could not miss if he fired again. In five shots, he knew that he could drop as many men, and within him there was a perfect consciousness that they would not hit him when they returned the fire. He was not filled with exalting courage. He was cold with fear, but it was the sort of fear which makes a man want to fling himself from a great height. But sitting there, calmly in the saddle, he saw a strange thing, the five men raising their dead leader and turning back toward the direction from which they had come. Not once did they look toward the form of Andy Lanning. They knew what he could not know, that the gate of the law had been opened to this man as a retreat, but the bullet which struck down Bill Dozier had closed the gate and thrust him out from mercy. He was an outlaw, a leper now. Anyone who shared his society from this moment on would fall under the heavy hand of the law. But as for running him to the ground, they had lost their appetite for such fighting. They had kept up a long-running fight and gained nothing, but a single shot from the fugitive had produced this result. They turned now in silence and went back, very much as dogs turn and tuck their tails between their legs when the wolf, which they have chased away from the precincts of the ranch house, feels himself once more safe from the hand of man and whirls with a flash of teeth. The sun gleamed on the barrel of Andy Lanning's rifle, and these men rode back in silence. Feeling that they had witnessed one of those prodigies which were becoming fewer and fewer around Martindale, the birth of a desperado. Andy watched them skulking off with the body of Bill Dozier held upright by a man on either side of the horse. He watched them draw off across the hills, still with that nervous, almost irresistible impulse to raise one wild long cry and spur after them, shooting swift and straight over the head of the pinto. But he did not move, and now they dropped out of sight, and then, looking about him, Andrew Lanning felt how vast were those hills, how wide they stretched, and how small he stood among them. He was utterly alone. There was nothing but the hills and the sky growing pale with heat, and the patches of olive-gray sagebrush in the distance. A great melancholy dropped upon Andy. He felt a childish weakness. Dropping his elbows upon the pommel of the saddle, he buried his face in his hands. In that moment, he needed desperately something to which he could appeal for comfort. The weakness passed slowly. He dismounted and looked his horse over carefully. The pinto had many good points. He had ample girth of chest at the cinches, where lung capacity is best measured. He had rather short forelegs, which promised weight-carrying power and some endurance, and he had a fine pair of sloping shoulders. But his croup sloped down too much, and he had a short neck. Andy knew perfectly well that no horse with a short neck can run fast for any distance. He had chosen the Pinto for endurance, and endurance he undoubtedly had. But he would need a horse which could put him out of short shooting distance and do it quickly. There were no illusions in the mind of Andrew Lanning about what lay before him. Uncle Jasper had told him too many tales of his own experiences on the trail in enemy country. There's three things, the old man had often said, that a man needs when he's in trouble. A gun that's smooth as silk, 
a horse full of running, and a friend. For the gun, Andy had his colt in the holster, and he knew it like his own mind. There were newer models and trickier weapons, but none which worked so smoothly under the touch of Andy. Thinking of this, he produced it from the holster with a flick of his fingers. The sight had been filed away. When he was a boy in short trousers, he had learned from Uncle Jasper the two main articles of a gunfighter's creed, that a revolver must be fired by pointing, not sighting, and that there must be nothing about it liable to hang in the holster to delay the draw. The great idea was to get the gun on your man with lightning speed, and then fire from the hip with merely a sense of direction to guide the bullet. He had a gun, therefore, and one necessity was his. Sorely he needed a horse of quality, as few men needed one. And he needed still more a friend, a haven in time of crisis, an adviser in difficulties. And, though Andy knew that it was death to go among men, he knew also that it was death to do without these two things. He believed that there was one chance left to him, and that was to outdistance the news of the two killings by riding straight north. There he would stop at the first town, in some manner fill his pockets with money, and in some manner find both horse and friend. Andrew Lanning was both simple and credulous, but it must be remembered that he had led a sheltered life, comparatively speaking. He had been brought up between a blacksmith's shop on the one hand and Uncle Jasper on the other, and the gaps in his knowledge of men were many and huge. The prime necessity now was the speed to the northward, so Andy flung himself into the saddle and drove his horse north at the jogging, rocking lope of the cattle pony. He was in a shallow basin, which luckily pointed in the right direction for him. The hills sloped down from it from either side in long fingers, with narrow gullies between, but as Andy passed the first of these pointing fingers, a new thought came to him. It might be, why not, that the posse had made only a pretense of withdrawing at once with the body of the dead man. Perhaps they had only waited until they were out of sight and then had circled swiftly around, leaving one man with the body. They might be waiting now at the mouth of any of these gullies. No sooner had the thought come to Andy than he whitened. The pinto had been worked hard that morning and all the night before, but now Andy sent the spurs home without mercy as he shot up the basin at full speed, with his revolver drawn, ready for a snapshot and a drop behind the far side of his horse. For half an hour he rode in this fashion, with his heart beating at his teeth, and each canyon as he passed was empty, and each had some shrub, like a crouching man, to startle him and upraise the revolver. At length, with the pinto wheezing from his new effort, he drew back to an easier gait. But still he had a companion ceaselessly following, like the shadow of the horse he rode. It was fear, and it would never leave him. End of chapter 9「Ten of Way of the Lawless by Max Brand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. After that forced and early rising, the rest of the house had remained awake, but Anne Withero was gifted with an exceptionally strong set of nerves. She had gone back to bed and had fallen promptly into a pleasant sleep, and when she awakened, all that happened in the night was filmed over and had become dreamlike. No one disturbed her rest, but when she went down to a late breakfast, she found Charles Merchant lingering in the room. He had questioned her closely, and after a moment of thought, she told him exactly what had happened, because she was perfectly aware that he would not believe a word of it, and she was right. He had sat opposite her, drumming his fingers without noise on the table, with a smile now and then, which was tinged, she thought, with insolence. Yet he seemed oddly undisturbed. She had expected some jealous outburst, some keen questioning of the motives which had made her beg them not to pursue this man. But Charles Merchant 
was only interested in what the fellow had said and done when he talked with her. He was just like a man out of a book, said the girl in conclusion, and I'll wager that he's been raised on romances. He had the face for it, you know, and the wild look. A blacksmith in Martindale, raised on romances, Charles had said, as he fingered his throat, which was patched with black and blue. A blacksmith in Martindale, she repeated slowly, and it brought a new view of the affair home to her. Now that they knew from Bill Dozier that the victim in Martindale had been only injured and not actually killed, the whole matter became rather a farce. It would be an amusing tale. But now, as Charles Merchant repeated the words, Blacksmith, Martindale, the new idea shocked her. The new idea of Andrew Lanning, for Charles had told her the name. The new thought stayed with her when she went back to her room after breakfast, ostensibly to read, but really to think. Remembering Andrew Lanning, she got past the white face and the brilliant black eyes. She felt, looking back, that he had shown a restraint which was something more than boyish. When he took her in his arms just before he fled, he had not kissed her, though, for that matter, she had been perfectly ready to let him do it. That moment kept reoccurring to her, the beating on the door, the voices in the hall, the shouts, and the arms of Andrew Lanning around her, and his tense, desperate face close to hers. It became less dreamlike that moment. She began to understand that if she lived to be a hundred, she would never find that memory dimmer. A half-sad, half-happy smile was touching the corners of her mouth when Charles Merchant knocked at her door. She gave herself one moment in which to banish the queer pain of knowing that she would never see this wild Andrew again, and then she told Charles to come in. In fact, he was already opening the door. He was calm of face, but she guessed an excitement beneath the surface. "'I've got something to show you,' he said. A great thought made her sit up in the chair, but she was afraid just then to stand up. I know. The posse has reached that silly boy and brought him back, but I don't want to see him again, handcuffed and all that. The posse is here, at least, said Charles noncommittedly. She was finding something new in him. The fact that he could think and hide his thoughts from her was indeed very new, for when she first met him, he had seemed all surface, all clean young manhood, without a stain. "'Do you want me to see the six brave men again?' she asked, smiling. But really, she was prying at his mind to get a clue of the truth. "'Well, I'll come down.' And she went down the stairs with Charles Merchant beside her. He kept looking straight ahead, biting his lips, and this made her wonder. She began to hum a gay little tune, and the first bar made the man start. So she kept on. She was bubbling with apparent good nature, when Charles, all gravity, opened the door of the living room. The shades were drawn. The quiet in that room was a deadly living thing. And then she saw on the sofa at one side of the place a human form under a sheet. Charles whispered the girl. She put out her hand and touched his shoulder, but she could not take her eyes off that ghastly dead thing. They, they... He's dead, Andrew Lanning. Why did you bring me here? Take the cloth from his face, commanded Charles Merchant, and there was something so hard in his voice that she obeyed. The sheet came away under her touch, and she was looking into the sallow face of Bill Dozier. She had remembered him because of the sad mustaches that morning and his big voice. That's what your romantic boy out of a book has done, said Charles Merchant. Look at his work but she dropped the sheet and whirled on him. And they left him, she said. Anne, said he, are you thinking about the safety of that murderer now? He's safe, but they'll get him later on. He's as good as dead, if that's what you want to know. God help him, said the girl. And going back a pace, she stood in the thick shadow, leaning against the wall with one hand across her lips. It reminded Charles of the picture he had seen when he broke into her room after Andrew Lanning had escaped. 
and she looked now, as then, more beautiful, more holy to be desired than he had ever known her before. Yet he could neither move nor speak. He saw her go out of the room. Then, without stopping to replace the sheet, he followed. He had hoped to wipe the last thought of that vagabond blacksmith out of her mind with the shock of this horror. Instead, he knew now that he had done quite another thing, and in addition had probably made her despise him for taking her to confront such a sight. All in all, Charles Merchant was exceedingly thoughtful as he closed the door and stepped into the hall. He ran up the stairs to her room. The door was closed. There was no answer to his knock, and by trying the knob he found that she had locked herself in, and the next moment he could hear her sobbing. He stood for a moment more, listening and wishing Andrew Lanning dead with all his heart. Then he went down to the garage, climbed into his car, and burned up the road between his place and that of Hal Dozier. There was very little similarity between the two brothers. Bill had been tall and lean. Hal was compact and solid, and he had the fighting agility of a starved coyote. He had a smooth, shaven face as well, and a clear gray eye, which was known wherever men gathered in the mountain desert. There was no news to give him. A telephone message had already told him of the death of Bill Dozier. But, said Charles Merchant, there's one thing I can do. I can set you free to run down this Lanning. How? You're needed on your ranch, Hal, but I want you to let me stand the expense of this trip. Take your time, make sure of him, and run him into the ground. My friend, said Hal Dozier, you turn a pleasure into a real party. And Charles Merchant left, knowing that he had signed the death warrant of young Lanning, in all the history of the mountain desert, there was a tale of only one man who had escaped once Hal Dozier took his trail, and that man had blown out his own brains. End of chapter 10《Of Way of the Lawless》by Max Brand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Far away in the western sky, Andrew Lanning saw a black dot that moved in wide circles and came across the heavens slowly, and he knew it was a buzzard that scented carrion and was coming up the wind toward that scent. He had seen them many a time before on their gruesome trails, and the picture which he carried was not a pleasant one. But now the picture that drifted through his mind was still more horrible. It was a human body, lying face down in the sand, with the wind ruffling in the hair, and the hat rolled a few paces off, and the gun close to the outstretched hand. He knew from Uncle Jasper that no matter how far the trail led, or how many years it was ridden, the end of the outlaw was always the same, death and the body left to the buzzards, or else, in some barroom, a footfall from behind and a bullet through the back. The flesh of Andy crawled. It was not possible for him to relax in vigilance for a moment, lest danger come upon him when he least expected it, perhaps in some open space like this. He went on until the sun was low in the west and all the sky was rimmed with color. Dusk had come over the hills in a rush when he saw a house half lost in the shadows. It was a narrow-fronted, two-storied, unpainted, lonely place without a sign of a porch. Here, where there was no vestige of a town near, and where there was no telephone, the news of the deaths of Bill Dozier and Buck Heath could not have come. Andy accepted the house as a blessing and went straight toward it. But the days of carelessness were over for Andy, and he would never again approach a house without searching it like a human face. He studied this shack as he came closer. If there were people in the building, they did not choose to show a light. Andy went around to the rear of the house, where there was a low shed beside the corral, half tumbled down. But in the corral were five or six fine horses, wild fellows with bright eyes and the long necks of speed. 
Andy looked upon them wistfully. Not one of them but was worth the price of three of the Pinto, but as for money, there was not twenty dollars in the pocket of Andy. Stripping the saddle from the Pinto, he put it under the shed and left the Mustang to feed and find water in the small pasture. Then he went with the bridle, that immemorial sign of one who seeks hospitality in the West, toward the house. He was met halfway by a tall, strong man of middle age or more. There was no hat on his head, which was covered with a shock of brown hair much younger than the face beneath it. He beheld Andy without enthusiasm. "'You figure on laying over here for the night, stranger?' he asked. "'That's it,' said Andy. "'I'll tell you how it is,' said the big man, in the tone of one who is willing to argue a point. "'We ain't got a very big house. You see it. And it's pretty well filled right now. If you was to slope over the hills there, you'd find Gainerville inside of ten miles.' Andy explained that he was at the end of a hard ride. Ten more miles would kill the Pinto, he said. But if you don't mind, I'll have a bit of chow and then turn in out there in the shed. That won't crowd you in your sleeping quarters, and it'll be fine for me. The big man opened his mouth to say something more, then turned on his heel. I guess we can fix you up, he said. Come on along. At another time, Andy would have lost a hand rather than accept such churlish hospitality, but he was in no position to choose. The pain of hunger was like a voice speaking in him. It was a four-room house. The rooms on the ground floor were the kitchen, where Andy cooked his own supper of bacon and coffee and flapjacks, and the combination living room, dining room, and from the bunk covered with blankets on one side, bedroom. Upstairs, there must have been two more rooms of the same size. Seated about a little kitchen table in the front room, Andy found three men playing an interrupted game of blackjack, which was resumed when the big fellow took his place before his hand. The three gave Andy a look and a grunt, but otherwise they paid no attention to him. And if they had consulted him, he could have asked for no greater favor. Yet he had an odd hunger about seeing them. They were the last men in many a month, perhaps, whom he could permit to see him without fear. He brought his supper into the living room and put his cup of coffee on the floor beside him. While he ate, he watched them. They were, all in all, the least prepossessing group he had ever seen. The man who had brought him in was far from well-favored, but he was handsome compared with the others. Opposite him sat a tall fellow, very erect and stiff in his chair. A candle had recently been lighted, and it stood on the table near this man. It showed a wan face of excessive leanness. His eyes were deep under bony brows, and they, alone of the features, showed any expression as the game progressed, turning now and again to the other faces with glances that burned. He was winning steadily. A red-headed man was on his left, with his back to Andy, but now and again he turned, and Andy saw a heavy jowl and a skin blotched with great rusty freckles. His shoulders overflowed the back of his chair, which creaked whenever he moved. The man who faced the redhead was as light as his companion was ponderous. His voice was gentle, his eyes large and soft, and his profile was exceedingly handsome. But in the full view, Andy saw nothing except a grisly purple scar that twisted down beneath the right eye of the man. It drew down the lower lid of that eye, and it pulled the mouth of the man a bit awry, so that he seemed to be smiling in a smug, half-apologetic manner. In spite of his youth, he was unquestionably the dominant spirit here. Once or twice the others lifted their voices in argument, and a single word from him cut them short. And when he raised his head now and again to look at Andy, it gave the latter a feeling that his secret was read and all his past known. These strange fellows had not asked his name, and neither had they introduced themselves. But from their table talk he gathered 
that the redhead was named Jeff, the funeral man with the bony face was Larry, the brown-haired one was Joe, and he of the scar and the smile was Henry. It occurred to Andy as odd that such rough boon companions had not shortened that name for convenience. They played with the most intense concentration. As the night deepened and the windows became black slabs, Joe brought another candle and reinforced this light by hanging a lantern from the nail on the wall. This illuminated the entire room, but in a partial and dismal manner. The game went on. They were playing for high stakes. Andrew Lanning had never seen so much cash assembled at one time. They had stacks of unmistakable yellow gold before them, actually stacks. The winner was Larry. That skull-faced gentleman was fairly barricaded behind heaps of money. Andy estimated swiftly that there must be well over two thousand dollars in those stacks. He finished his supper, and having taken the tin cup and plate out into the next room and cleaned them, he had no sooner come back to the door on the verge of bidding them good night than Henry invited him to sit down and take a hand. End of chapter 11《Of Way of the Lawless》by Max Brand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. He had never studied any men as he was watching these men at cards. Andrew Lanning had spent most of his life quite indifferent to the people around him, but now it was necessary to make a quick and sure judgments. He had to read unreadable faces, he had to guess motives. He had to sense the coming of danger before it showed its face, and, watching them with close intentness, he understood that at least three of them were cheating at every opportunity. Henry alone was playing a square game. As for the heavy winner, Larry, Andrew had reason to believe that he was adroitly palming an ace now and then. Luck ran too consistently his way. For his own part, he was no card expert, and he smiled as Henry made his offer. "'I've got eleven dollars and fifty cents in my pocket,' Andrew said frankly. "'I won't sit in at that game.' "'Then the game is three-handed,' said Henry, as he got up from his chair. "'I've fed you boys enough,' he continued in his soft voice. "'I know a three-handed game is no good, but I'm through. "'Unless you'll try a round or two with them, stranger. "'They've made enough money.' Maybe they'll play for silver for the fun of it, huh, boys? There was no enthusiastic assent. The three looked gravely at a victim with eleven dollars and fifty cents, the chair of Big Jeff creaking noisily as he turned. Sit in, said Jeff. He made a brief gesture like one wiping an obstacle out of the way. All right, nodded Andy, for the thing began to excite him. He turned to Henry. Suppose you deal for us. The scar in Henry's face changed color, and his habitual smile broadened. Well, exclaimed Larry, maybe the gent don't like the way we've been running this game in other ways. Maybe he's got a few more suggestions to make. Sitting in, I'd like to be obliging. He grinned, and the effect was ghastly. Thanks, said Andy. That lets me out as far as suggestions go. He paused with his hand on the back of the chair, and something told him that Larry would as soon run a knife into him as take a drink of water. The eyes burned up at him out of the shadow of the brows, but Andy, though his heart leaped, made himself meet the stare. Suddenly it wavered, and only then would Andy sit down. Henry had drawn up another chair. The idea looks good to me, he said. I think I shall deal. And forthwith, as one who may not be resisted, he swept up the cards and began to shuffle. The others at once lost interest. Each of them nonchalantly produced silver, and they began to play negligently, careless of their stakes. But to Andy, who had only played for money half a dozen times before, this was desperately earnest. He kept to a conservative game, and slowly but surely 
he saw his silver being converted into gold. Only Larry noticed his gains. The others were indifferent to it, but the skull-faced man tightened his lips as he saw. Suddenly he began betting in gold, ten dollars for each card he drew. The others were out of that hand. Andy, breathless, for he had an ace down, saw a three and a two fall, took the long chance, and, with the luck behind him, watched the five spot flutter down to join his draw. Yet Larry, taking the same draw, was not busted. He had a pair of deuces and a four. Then he stuck, and it stood to reason that he could not win. Yet he bet recklessly, raising Andy twice, until the latter had no more money on the table to call a higher bet. The showdown revealed an ace under cover for Larry also. Now he leaned across the table, smiling at Andrew. "'I like the hand you show,' said Larry. "'But I don't like your face behind it, my friend.' His smile went out, his hand jerked back, and then the lean, small hand of Henry shot out and fastened on the tall man's wrist. "'You skunk,' said Henry. "'Do you want to get the kid for that beggarly mess? Bah!' Andy, colorless, his blood cold, brushed aside the arm of the intercessor. "'Partner,' he said, leaning a little forward in turn, and thereby making his holster swing clear of the seat of his chair. "'Partner, I don't mind your words, but I don't like the way you say em. When he began to speak, his voice was shaken. Before he had finished, his tones rang, and he felt once more that overwhelming desire, which was like the impulse to fling himself from a height. He had felt it before, when he watched the posse retreat with the body of Bill Dozier. He felt it now, a vast hunger, an almost blinding eagerness to see Larry make an incriminating move with his bony, hovering right hand. The bright eyes burned at him for a moment longer out of the shadow. Then again they wavered and turned away. Andy knew that the fellow had no more stomach for a fight. Shame might have made him go through with the thing he started, however, had not Henry cut in again and given Larry a chance to withdraw gracefully. "'The kids called your bluff, Larry,' he said, "'and the rest of us don't need to see you pull any target practice. Shake hand with the kid, will you, and tell him you were joking.' Larry settled back in his chair with a grunt, and Henry, without a word, tipped back in his chair and kicked the table. Andy beside him, saw the move start, and had just time to scoop his own winnings, including that last rich bet, off the tabletop and into his pocket. As for the rest of the coin, it slid with a noisy jangle to the floor, and it turned the other three men into scrambling madmen. They scratched and clawed at the money, cursing volubly, and Andy, stepping back out of the fracas, saw the scar-faced man watching with a smile of contempt. There was a snarl. Jeff had Joe by the throat, and Joe was reaching for his gun. Henry moved forward to interfere once more, but this time he was not needed. A clear whistling sounded outside the house, and a moment later the door was kicked open. A man came in with his saddle on his hip. His appearance converted the threatening fight into a scene of jovial good nature. The money was swept up at random, as though none of them had the slightest care what became of it. "'Having one of your little parties, huh?' said the stranger. "'What started it?' "'He did, Scotty,' answered Larry, and stretching out an arm of enormous length, he pointed at Andrew. Again it required the intervention of Henry to explain matters, and Scotty, with his hands on his hips, turned and surveyed Andrew with considering eyes. He was much different from the rest, whereas they had one and all a peculiarly unhealthy effect upon Andy, this newcomer was a cheery fellow, with an eye as clear as crystal and color in his tanned cheeks. He had one of those long faces which invariably imply shrewdness, and he canted his head to one side while he watched Andy. "'You're him that put the pinto in the corral, I guess,' he said." Andy nodded. There was no further mention of the troubles of that card game. Jeff and Joe and Larry were instantly busied about the kitchen and in arranging the table, 
while Scotty, after the manner of a guest, bustled about and accomplished little. But the eye of Andy, then and thereafter, whenever he was near the five, kept steadily upon the scar-faced man. Henry had tilted his chair back against the wall. The night had come on chill, with a rising wind that hummed through the cracks of the ill-built wall and tossed the flame in the throat of the chimney. Henry draped the coat like a cloak around his shoulders and buried his chin in his hands, separated from the others by a vast gulf. Presently, Scotty was sitting at the table. The others were gathered round him in expectant attitudes. "'What's new?' they exclaimed in one voice. "'Oh, about a million things. Let me get some of this ham into my face, and then I'll talk. I've got a batch of newspapers yonder. There's a gold rush on up to Tolliver's Creek.' Andy blinked, for that news was at least four weeks old. But now came a tide of other news, and almost all of it was stale stuff to him. But the men drank it all in, all except Henry, silent in his corner. He was relaxed, as if he slept. But the most news is about the killing of Bill Dozier. End of chapter 12《of Way of the Lawless》by Max Brand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Oh, Bill grunted, red-headed Jeff. Well, I'll be hung. There's one good deed done. He was overdue, anyways. Andy, waiting breathlessly, watched lest the eye of the narrator should swing toward him for the least part of a second. But Scotty seemed utterly oblivious to the fact that he sat in the same room with the murderer. Well, he got it, said Scotty, and he didn't get it from behind. Seems there was a young gent in Martindale. All you boys know old Jasper Lanning. There was an answering chorus. Well, he's got a nephew, Andrew Lanning. This kid was sort of a bashful kind, they say. But yesterday he up and bashed the fellow in the jaw, and the man went down, whacked his head on a rock, and young Lanning thought his man was dead. So he holds off the crowd with a gun, hops a horse, and beats it. Pretty, pretty, murmured Larry. But what's that got to do with that hyena, Bill Dozier? I don't get it all hitched up straight. Most of the news comes from Martindale to town by telephone. Seems this young Lanning was followed by Bill Dozier. He was always a hound for a job like that, huh? There was a growl of assent. He handpicked five rough ones and went after Lanning, chased him all night, landed at Joe Merchant's place. The kid had dropped in there to call on a girl. Can you beat that for cold nerve? Him figuring that he killed a man and Bill Dozier and five more on his trail to bring him back, to wait and see whether the buck he dropped lived or died, and then to slide over and call on a lady. No, you can't raise that. But the tidings were gradually breaking in upon the mind of Andrew Lanning. Buck Heath had not been dead. The pursuit was simply to bring him back on some charge of assault. And now Bill Dozier, the head of Andrew, swam. Seems he didn't know her either. Just paid a call round about dawn and then rode on. Bill comes along a little later on the trail, gets new horses from Merchant, and runs down Lanning early this morning. Runs him down, and then Lanning turns in the saddle and drills Bill through the head at five hundred yards. Henry came to life. How far? he said. That's what they got over the telephone, said Scotty, apologetically. Then the news got to Hal Dozier from Merchant's house. Hal hops on the wire and gets in touch with the governor, and in about ten seconds they make this Lanning kid an outlaw and stick a price on his head. Five thousand, I think, and they say Merchant is behind it. The telephone was buzzing with it when I left town, and most of the boys were oiling up their gats and getting ready to make a play. Pretty easy money, huh, for putting the rollers under a kid? Andrew Lanning muttered aloud, an outlaw. Not the first time Bill Dozier has done it, said Henry calmly. That's an old maneuver of his, to hound a man 
from a little crime to a big one. The throat of Andrew was dry. Did you get a description of young Lanning, he asked. Sure, nodded Scotty. Twenty-three years old, about five feet ten, black hair and black eyes, good-looking, big shoulders, quiet-spoken. Andy made a gesture and looked carelessly out the back window, but from the corner of his eyes he was noting the five men. Not a line of their expressions escaped him. He was seen literally with eyes in the back of his head, and if by the interchange of one knowing glance or by a significant silence even these fellows had indicated that they remotely guessed his identity, he would have been on his feet like a tiger, gun in hand and backing for the door. Five thousand dollars? What would not one of these men do for that sum? Andy had been keyed to the breaking point before, but his alertness was now trebled, and like a sensitive barometer, he felt the danger of Larry, the brute strength of Jeff, the cunning of Henry, the grave poise of Joe, to say nothing of Scotty, an unknown force. But Scotty was running on in his talk. He was telling of how he met the storekeeper in town. He was naming everything he saw. These fellows seemed to hunger for the minutest news of men. They broke into admiring laughter when Scotty told of his victorious tilt of jesting with the storekeeper's daughter. Even Henry came out of his patient gloom long enough to smile at this, and the rest were like children. Larry was laughing so heartily that his eyes began to twinkle. He even invited Andrew in on the mirth. At this point Andy stood up and stretched elaborately, but in stretching he put his arms behind him and stretched them down rather than up so that his hands were never far from his hips. "'I'll be turning in,' said Andy, and stepping back to the door so that his face would be toward them until the last instant of his exit, he waved good night. There was a brief shifting of eyes toward him and a grunt from Jeff, that was all. Then the eye of everyone reverted to Scotty, but the latter broke off his narrative. Ain't you sleeping in, he asked. We could fix you a bunk upstairs, I guess. Once more the glance of Andrew flashed from face to face, and then he saw the first suspicious thing. Scotty was looking straight at Henry, in the corner, as though waiting for direction, and from the corner of his eye, Andrew was aware that Henry had nodded ever so slightly. Here's something you might be interested to know, said Scotty. This young Lanning was riding a pinto horse, he added, while Andrew stood rooted to the spot. You seemed sort of interested in the description. I allowed, maybe you'd try your hand at finding him. Andy understood perfectly well that he was known, and with his left hand frozen against the knob of the door, he flattened his shoulders against the wall and stood ready for the draw. In the crisis, at the first hostile move, he decided he would dive straight for the table, low. It would tumble the room into darkness as the candles fell, a semi-darkness, for there would be a sputtering lantern still. Then he would fight for his life. And, looking at the others, he saw that they were changed indeed. They were all facing him, and their faces were alive with interest, yet they made no hostile move. No doubt they awaited the signal of Henry. There was the greatest danger, and now Henry stood up. His first words was a throwing down of disguises. Mr. Lanning, he said, I think this is a time for introductions. That cold exultation, that wild impulse to throw himself into the arms of danger, was sweeping over Andrew. He made no gesture toward his gun, though his fingers were curling, but he said, Friends, I've got you all in my eye. I'm going to open this door and go out. No harm to any of you. But if you try to stop me, it means trouble, a lot of trouble, quick. Just a split second of suspense. If a foot stirred or a hand raised, Andrew's curling hand would jerk up and bring out a revolver, and every man in the room knew it. Then the voice of Henry. You plan on fighting us all? Take my bridle off the wall, said Andrew, looking straight before him at no face, and thereby enabled to see everything, just as the boxer 
looks in the eye of his opponent, and thereby sees every move of his gloves. Take my bridle off the wall, you, Jeff, and throw it at my feet. The bridle rattled at his feet. This has gone far enough, said Henry. Lanning, you've got the wrong idea. I'm going ahead with the introductions. The red-headed fellow we call Jeff is better known to the public as Jeff Rankin. Does that mean anything to you? Jeff Rankin acknowledged the introduction with a broad grin, the corners of his mouth being lost in the heavy folds of his jowls. I see it doesn't, went on Henry. Very well. Joe's name is Joe Clune. Yonder sits Scotty McDougal. There is Larry LaRoche, and I am Henry Allister. The edge of Andrew's alertness was suddenly dulled. The last name swept into his brain a wave of meaning. For all the words on the mountain desert, there was none more familiar than Henry Allister. Scar-faced Allister, they called him, one of those deadly men who figured in the tales of Uncle Jasper. Henry Allister was the last and the most grim. A thousand stories clustered about him, of how he killed Watkins, of how Langley, the famous federal marshal, trailed him for five years and was finally killed in a duel which left Allister with that scar, of how he broke jail at Garrisonville and again at St. Luke City. In the imagination of Andrew, he had loomed like a giant, some seven-foot prodigy, whiskered, savage of eye, terrible of voice. And, turning toward him, Andrew saw him in profile with a scar obscured, and his face was of almost feminine refinement. Five thousand dollars? A dozen rich men in the mountain desert would each pay more than that for the apprehension of Alistair, dead or alive. And bitterly it came over Andrew that this genius of crime, this heartless murderer, as story depicted him, was no danger to him, but almost a friend. And the other four ruffians of Alistair's band were smiling cordially at him, enjoying his astonishment. The day before, his hair would have turned white in such a place among such men. Tonight, they were his friends. End of chapter 13《Of Way of the Lawless》by Max Brand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. After that, things happened to Andrew in a swirl. They were shaking hands with him. They were congratulating him on the killing of Bill Dozier. They were patting him on the back. Larry LaRoche, who had been so hostile, now stood up to the full of his ungainly height and proposed his health. And the other men drank it standing. Andy received a tin cup full of whiskey, and he drank the burning stuff in acknowledgment. The unaccustomed drink went to his head. His muscles began to relax. His eyes swam. Voices boomed at him out of a haze. Why, he's only a young kid. One shot put him under the weather. Shut up, Larry. He'll learn fast enough. Ah, yes, said Larry to himself. He'll learn fast enough. Presently, he was lifted and carried by strong arms up a creaking stairs. He looked up, and he saw the red hair of the mighty Jeff, who carried him as if he had been a child, and deposited him among some blankets. I didn't know, Larry LaRoche was saying. How could I tell a man-killer like him couldn't stand no more than a girl? Shut up and get out, said another voice. Heavy footsteps retreated. Then Andrew heard them once more, grumbling and booming below him. After that, his head cleared rapidly. Two windows were open in this higher room, and a sharp current of the night wind blew across him, clearing his mind as rapidly as wind blows away a fog. Now he made out that one man had not left him, the dark outline of him was by the bed, waiting. "'Who's there?' asked Andrew. "'Alister, take it easy.' "'I'm all right. I'll go down again to the boys. "'That's what I'm here to talk to you about, kid. "'Are you sure your head's clear?' "'Yep, sure thing.' 
Then listen to me, Lanning, while I talk. It's important. Stay here till the morning, then ride on. Where? Oh, away from Martindale, that's all. Out of the desert? Out of the mountains? Of course. They'll hunt for you here. Alistair paused, then went on. And when you get away, what will you do? Go straight? God willing, said Andrew fervently. It was only luck, bad luck, that put me where I am. The outlaw scratched a match and lighted a candle. Then he dropped a little of the melted tallow on a box, and by that light he peered earnestly into Andrew's face. He appeared to need this light to read the expression on it. It enabled Andrew to see the face of Alistair. Sometimes the play of shadows made that face unreal as a dream. Sometimes the face was filled with poetic beauty. Sometimes the light gleamed on the scar and the sardonic smile, and then it was a face out of hell. "'You're going to get away from the mountain desert and go straight,' said Alistair. "'That's it.' He saw that the outlaw was staring with a smile, half grim and half sad, into the shadows and far away. "'Lanning, let me tell you, you'll never get away.' "'You don't understand,' said Andrew. "'I don't like fighting. It makes me sick inside. I'm not a brave man.' He waited to see the contempt come to the face of the famous leader, but there was nothing but grave attention. Why, Andy went on in a rush of confidence, everybody in Martindale knows that I'm not a fighter. Those fellows downstairs think that I'm a sort of bad hombre. I'm not. Why, Alistair, when I turned over Buck Heath and saw his face, I nearly fainted, and then... Wait, cut in the other... That was your first man. You didn't kill him, but you thought you had. You nearly fainted then. But as I gather it, after you shot Bill Dozier, you simply sat on your horse and waited. Did you feel like fainting then? No, explained Andrew hastily. I wanted to go after them and shoot them all. They could have rushed me and taken me prisoner easily, but they wanted to shoot me from a distance, and it made me mad to see them work it. I hated them all, and I had reason for it, curse them. He added hurriedly, but I've got no grudge against anybody. All I want is a chance to live quiet and clean. There was a faint sigh from Alistair. Lanning, he murmured, the minute I laid eyes on you, I knew you were one of my kind. In all my life, I've known only one other with that same chilly effect in his eyes. That was Marshal Langley, only he happened to be on the side of the law. No matter, he had the iron dust in him. He was cut out to be a man-killer. You say you want to get away. Lanning, you can't do it, because you can't get away from yourself. I'm making a long talk to you, but you're worth it. I tell you, I read your mind. You plan on riding north and getting out of the mountain desert before the countryside there is raised against you the way it's raised to the south. In the first place, I don't think you'll get away. Hal Dozier is on your trail, and he'll get to the north and raise the whole district and stop you before you hit the towns. You have to go back to the mountain desert. You'll have to do it eventually. Why not do it now? Lanning, if I had you at my back, I could laugh at the law the rest of our lives. Stay with me. I can tell a man when I see him. I saw you call Larry LaRoche, and I've never wanted a man the way I want you, not to follow me, but as a partner. Shake and say you will. The slender hand was stretched out through the shadows. The light from the candle flashed on it, and a power outside his own will made Andrew move his hand to meet it. He stopped the gesture with a violent effort. The swift voice of the outlaw with a fiber of earnest persuasion in it, went on. You see what I risk to get you? Hal Dozier is on your trail. He's the only man in the world I'd think twice about before I met him face to face. But if I join to you, I'll have to meet him sooner or later. Well, Lanning, I'll take that risk. I know he's more devil than man when it comes to gunplay, but we'll meet him together. Give me your hand." There was a riot in the brain of Andrew Lanning. 
The words of the outlaw had struck something in him that was like metal chiming on metal. Iron dust, that was it, the call of one blood to another, and he realized the truth of what Alistair said. If he touched the hand of this man, there would be a bond between them which only death could break. In one blinding rush, he sensed the strength and the faith of Alistair. But another voice was at his ear, and he saw Anne Withero, as she had stood for that moment in his arms in her room. It came over him with a chill like cold moonlight. "'Do you fear me?' he had whispered. "'No. Will you remember me? Forever.' And with that ghost of a voice in his ear, Andrew Lanning groaned to the man beside him. "'Partner, I know you're nine-tenths man, and I thank you out of the bottom of my heart. But there's someone else has a claim to me. I don't belong to myself.' There was a breathless pause. Anger contracted the face of Henry Allister. He nodded gravely. "'It's the girl you went back to see,' he said. "'Yes.' "'Well, then, go ahead and try to win through. I wish you luck. But if you fail, remember what I've said. Now, or ten years from now, what I've said goes for you. Now roll over and sleep. Goodbye, Lanning. Or rather, au revoir.'" End of chapter 14「Way of the Lawless」by Max Brand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The excitement kept Andrew awake for a little time, but then the hum of the wind, the roll of voices below him, and the weariness of the long ride rushed on him like a wave and washed him out into an ebb of sleep. When he wakened, the aches were gone from his limbs, and his mind was a happy blank. Only when he started up from his blankets and wrapped his head against the slanting rafters just above him, he was brought to a painful realization of where he was. He turned, scowling, and the first thing he saw was a piece of brown wrapping paper held down by a shoe and covered with a clumsy scrawl. These blankets are yours and the slicker along with them, and here's wishing you luck while you're beating it back to civilization. Your friend, Jeff Rankin. Andy glanced swiftly about the room and saw that the other bunks had been removed. He swept up the blankets and went down the stairs to the first floor. The house reeked of emptiness, broken bottles, a twisted tin plate in which someone had set his heel, were the last signs of the outlaws of Henry Allister's gang. A bundle stood on the table with another piece of wrapping paper near it. The name of Andrew Lanning was on the outside. He unfolded the sheet and read in a precise, rather feminine writing. Dear Lanning, we are, in a manner, sneaking off. I've already said goodbye, and I don't want to tempt you again. Now you're by yourself, and you've got your own way to fight. The boys agree with me. We all want to see you make good. We'll all be sorry if you come back to us. But once you've found out that it's no go trying to beat back to good society, we'll be mighty happy to have you with us. In the meantime, we want to do our bit to help Andrew Lanning make up for his bad luck. For my part, I've put a chamois sack on top of the leather coat with the fur lining. You'll find a little money in that purse. Don't be foolish. Take the money I leave you, and when you're back on your feet, I know that you'll repay it at your own leisure. And here's best of luck to you and the girl. Henry Allister. Andrew lifted the chamois sack carelessly, and out of its mouth tumbled a stream of gold. One by one he picked up the pieces and replaced them. Then he hesitated, and then put the sack in his pocket. How could he refuse a gift so delicately made? A broken kitchen knife had been thrust through a bit of paper on the box. He read this next. Your horse is known, so I'm leaving you one in place of the pinto. He goes good, and he don't need no spurring, 
but when you come behind him, keep watching your step. Your pal, Larry LaRoche. Blankets and slicker, money, horse, a flask of whiskey stood on another slip of paper, and the writing on this was much more legible. Here's a friend in need. When you come to a pinch, use it. And when you come to a bigger pinch, send word to your friend, Scotty McDougal. Andrew picked it up, set it down again, and smiled. On the fur coat, there was a fifth tag. Not one of the five, then, had forgotten him. It's coming on cold, partner. Take this coat and welcome. When the snows get on the mountains, if you ain't out of the desert, put on this coat and think of your partner. Joe Clune. P.S. I seen you first, and I have first call on you over the rest of these gents, and you can figure that you have first call on me. J.C. When he had read all these little letters, when he had gathered his loot before him, Andrew lifted his head and could have burst into song. This much thieves and murderers had done for him. What would the good men of the world do? How would they meet him halfway? He went into the kitchen. They had forgotten nothing. There was a quantity of chuck, flour, bacon, salt, coffee, a frying pan, a cup, a canteen. It brought a lump in his throat. He cast open the back door, and standing in the little pasture, he saw only one horse remaining. It was a fine, young chestnut gelding, with a Roman nose and long, mulish ears. His head was not beautiful to see from any angle, but every detail of the body spelled speed, and speed meant safety. What wonder, then, that Andrew began to see the world through a bright mist. What wonder that when he had finished his breakfast, he sang while he roped the chestnut, built the pack behind the saddle, and filled the saddlebags. When he was in the saddle, the gelding took at once the cattle path with a long and easy canter. With his head cleared by sleep, his muscles and nerves relaxed, Andrew began to plan his escape with more calm deliberation than before. The first goal was the big blue cloud on the northern horizon, a good week's journey ahead of him, the little Canover Mountains. Among the foothills lay the cordon of small towns which it would be his chief difficulty to pass. For if the printed notices describing him were circulated among them, the countryside would be up in arms, prepared to intercept his flight. Otherwise, there would be nothing but telephoned and telegraphed descriptions of him, which at best could only come to the ears of a few, and these few would be necessarily put out by the slightest difference between him and the description. Such a vital difference, for instance, as the fact that he now rode a chestnut, while the instructions called for a man on a pinto. Moreover, it was by no means certain that Hal Dozier, great trailer though he was, would know that the fugitive was making for the northern mountains. With all these things in mind, in spite of the pessimism of Henry Allister, Andrew felt that he had far more than a fighting chance to break out of the mountain desert and into the comparative safety of the crowded country beyond. He made one mistake in the beginning. He pushed the chestnut too hard the first and second days, so that on the third day he was forced to give the gelding his head and go at a jarring trot most of the day. On the fourth and fifth days, however, he had the reward for his caution. The chestnut's ribs were beginning to show painfully, but he kept doggedly at his work with no sign of faltering. The sixth day brought Andrew Lanning in close view of the lower hills, and on the seventh day he put his fortune boldly to the touch and jogged into the first little town before him. End of chapter 15《of Way of the Lawless》by Max Brand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was just after the hot hour of the afternoon. The shadows from the hills to the west were beginning to drop across the village. People 
who had kept to their houses during the early afternoon, now appeared on their porches. Small boys and girls returning from school were beginning to play. Their mothers were at the open doors exchanging shouted pieces of news and greetings, and Andrew picked his way with care along the street. It was a town flung down in the throat of a ravine, without care or pattern. There was not even one street, but rather a collection of straggling paths which met about a sort of open square, on the sides of which were the stores and the inevitable saloons and hotels. But the narrow path along which Andrew rode was a gantlet to him. For all he knew, the placards might be already out. One of the least of those he passed might have recognized him. He noticed that one or two women in their front door stopped in the midst of a word to watch him curiously. It seemed to Andrew that a buzz of comment and warning preceded him and closed behind him. He felt sure that the children stood and gapped at him from behind, but he dared not turn in his saddle to look back. And he kept on, reining in the gelding and probing every face with one swift, resistless glance that went to the heart. He found himself literally taking the brains and hearts of men into the palm of his hand and weighing them. Yonder old man, so quiet, with the bony fingers clasped around the bowl of his corn-cob, sitting under the awning by the watering trough. That would be an ill man to cross in a pinch. That hand would be steady as a rock on the barrel of a gun. But the big square man, with the big square face who talked so loudly on the porch of yonder store, there was a bag of wind that could be punctured by one threat and turned into a figure of tallow by the sight of a gun. Andrew went on with his lightning summary of the things he passed, but when he came to the main square, the heart of the town, it was quite empty. He went across to the hotel, tied the gelding at the rack, and sat down on the veranda. He wanted with all his might to go inside, to get a room, to be alone and away from this battery of searching eyes, but he dared not. He must mingle with these people and learn what they knew. He went in and sought the bar. It should be there, if anywhere, the poster with the announcement of Andrew Lanning's outlawry and the picture of him. What picture would they take? The old snapshot of the year before, which Jasper had taken? No doubt that would be the one. But much as he yearned to do so, he dared not search the wall. He stood up to the bar and faced the bartender. The latter favored him with one searching glance and then pushed across the whiskey bottle. "'Do you know me?' asked Andrew with surprise, and then he could have cursed his careless tongue. "'I know you need a drink,' said the bartender, looking at Andrew again. Suddenly he grinned. "'When a man's been dry that long, he gets a hungry look around his eyes that I know. Hit her hard, boy.' Andrew brimmed his glass and tossed off the drink, and to his astonishment there was none of the shocking effect of his first drink of whiskey. It was like a drop of water tossed on a huge blotter. To his tired nerves the alcohol was a mere nothing. Besides, he dared not let it affect him. He filled a second glass, pushing across the bar one of the gold pieces of Henry Allister. Then, turning casually, he glanced along the wall. There were other notices up, many written ones, but not a single face looked back at him. All at once he grew weak with relief. But in the meantime, he must talk to this fellow. What's the news? What kind of news? Any kind. I've been talking more to coyotes than the men for a long spell. Should he have said that? Was not that a suspicious speech? Did it not expose him utterly? Nothing to talk about here much more exciting than a coyote's yap. Not a damn thing. Which way you come from? South. The last I heard of exciting news was the stuff about Lanning, the outlaw. It was out, and he was glad of it. He had taken the bull by the horns. Lanning? Lanning? Never heard of him. Oh, yes, the gent that bumped off Bill Dozier. 
Between you and me, they won't be any sobbing for that. Bill had it coming. But they outlawed Lanning, have they? That's what I hear. But sweet beyond words had been this speech from the bartender. They had barely heard of Andrew Lanning in this town. They did not even know that he was outlawed. Andrew felt hysterical laughter bubbling in his throat. Now, for one long sleep, then he would make the ride across the mountains and into safety. He went out of the bar room, put the gelding away in the stables behind the hotel, and got a room. In ten minutes, pausing only to tear the boots from his feet, he was sound asleep under the very gates of freedom. And while he slept, the gates were closing and barring the way. If he had wakened even an hour sooner, all would have been well, and, though he might have dusted the skirts of danger, they could never have blocked his way. But with seven days of exhausting travel behind him, he slept like one drugged, the clock around and more. It was morning, mid-morning, when he wakened. Even then he was too late. But he wasted priceless minutes eating his breakfast, for it was delightful beyond words to have food served to him which he had not cooked with his own hands. And so, sauntering out onto the veranda of the hotel, he saw a compact crowd on the other side of the square, and the crowd focused on a man who was tacking up a sign. Andrew, still sauntering, joined the crowd, and, looking over their heads, he found his own face staring back at him, and, under the picture of that lean, serious face in huge black type, five thousand dollars reward for the capture, dead or alive. The rest of the notice blurred before his eyes. Someone was speaking. You made a quick trip, Mr. Dozier, and I expect if you sent word up to Hallowell in the mountains, they can. So how Dozier had brought the notices himself. Andrew in that moment became perfectly calm. He went back to the hotel, and resting one elbow on the desk, he looked calmly into the face of the clerk and the proprietor. Instantly, he saw that the men did not suspect, as yet. "'I hear Mr. Dozier's here,' he asked. "'Room seventeen, said the clerk. "'Hold on. He's out in the square now. "'It's all right. I'll wait in his room.' He went to room seventeen. The door was unlocked. And drawing a chair into the farthest corner, Andrew sat down, rolled a cigarette, drew his revolver, and waited. End of chapter 16